What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here and welcome to the third episode in my Aircraft Dissected series, wherein I delve into every single switch, knob and display in the flight deck of the Airbus A320 family of aircraft to give you guys an in-depth understanding of every system present within this aircraft. So, just as a little recap, in the previous two episodes, we had taken a look at both the left and the central column of the lower overhead panel. And in this episode, we'll be wrapping up the overhead panel by covering the rightmost column. Naturally, the episode today will be shorter than the previous one as there isn't really much left to cover on this column, but it should still be fun and informative nevertheless. So with that all said, let's jump into the flight deck and get started. Alright, so starting at the top right of this column, we firstly have the audio control panel. As you can clearly see, there are several buttons, knobs, and dials here that allow pilots to control various radio transmissions as well as public address announcements within the aircraft. Now, one thing to note before we get started on this panel is that this specific control panel is the backup or standby audio control panel. The two main ones, used by both the captain as well as the first officer, are located on the central pedestal right beside both pilots, as you can see on screen here. However, for the sake of managing the length of future videos on the channel covering the central pedestal, we'll go ahead and cover the audio control panel in detail in this episode so we can shave some time off later on. Besides, all of these panels are identical in both their appearance as well as their operation. So, starting from this top row of buttons, these are the audio transmission buttons. Pilots can use these buttons to select the specific radios to transmit their audio from. These include a set of three VHF or very high frequency radios, a set of two HF or high frequency radios, a dedicated flight interphone radio, as well as a dedicated cabin interphone radio. Now, if you're a beginner to flight sims, you don't necessarily need to have a detailed understanding of all of these radios, but we'll cover them in some detail as we go along. So, starting from these VHF, or very high frequency radios, these are where all of the communication between pilots and ATC normally takes place. During normal operation, pilots would select a particular radio frequency and push any of these VHF 1, 2, or 3 buttons to be able to effortlessly communicate with ATC. The same goes for the two HF buttons. Now, the primary difference between the VHF and the HF radios is that VHF is used for shorter range communications that are line of sight in nature, meaning that the communication is taking place with a radio receiver that is in line of sight with the aircraft. Hence, VHF works for shorter range communications only. HF, on the other hand, since it operates on a slightly lower frequency range than the VHF radios, allows pilots to communicate on larger scales and distances. However, since pilots keep changing radio frequencies as they fly over different airspaces, the use of VHF radios is much more common than the HF radios. All of these buttons have this green light at the top, which signifies that pilots are transmitting on that particular radio. Additionally, these lights also have a little amber call light at the bottom. This call light illuminates when any of these non-active radios receive what's known as a cell cal. For those of you who don't know, cell cal stands for Selective Calling Radio System and is essentially a way for pilots as well as air traffic control to communicate on a closed radio channel. So, if ATC wants to communicate with the aircraft on VHF-2, they will send over a cell cow to the aircraft, which will illuminate this amber call light underneath the VHF-2 transmission switch, urging the pilots to push the switch and communicate with ATC on that specific radio. Alright, so moving on from the VHF and HF transmission buttons, on the right here, we have the flight interphone system, as well as the cabin interphone system. The flight interphone system allows communication between both the pilots as well as other members of flight crew in the flight deck. The system can be used in certain emergency situations, such as when oxygen masks need to be worn by both pilots that severely inhibit communication between them. The service interphone system will then connect the two pilots through the headsets they are wearing so that communication between the two can be re-established. On the right, we also have the cabin interphone system, which, as the name implies, allows pilots to communicate with the flight attendants in the cabin and galleys of the aircraft. Both these buttons also have these mech lights at the bottom, which serve different purposes. In the case of the flight interphone system, the mech light will illuminate if any ground personnel that have headsets connected to the aircraft wish to directly speak to the pilots. 
The mech light on the cabin interphone system, on the other hand, illuminates when a cabin crew member wishes to speak to a pilot in the cockpit. And that's that for these top row of transmission radio buttons on the audio control panel. Alright, so coming underneath, we have two sets of audio reception knobs, which obviously allow pilots to select which radios they would like to receive audio from. Now, unlike the audio transmission buttons at the top, there are two rows of audio reception knobs. This top row allows pilots to receive voice and communication audio, whereas this bottom row allows pilots to listen in on navigational audio, which we will get to in just a second. So this top row obviously pertains to the same radios we looked at previously, which includes the VHF radios, the HF radios, and the service and cabin interphone system. Pushing a knob in will illuminate it, signifying that reception on that specific radio is active. Additionally, the knob can also be turned to either direction to control volume of the audio being received. Now, one thing to note when it comes to audio reception is that transmitting audio on a particular radio would automatically also allow pilots to receive audio from that specific radio. For example, if pilots are transmitting audio on VHF-1, they need not also select VHF-1 as their audio reception source, as audio on VHF-1 will automatically be selected for the pilots. However, this is where it gets interesting. If pilots are transmitting audio on VHF-1, which also means they will receive audio from VHF-1, they can also select another audio reception source, say VHF-2 in this case. In this case, audio reception doesn't switch over from VHF-1 to VHF-2. Instead, pilots will be able to transmit only on VHF-1, but we will be able to receive audio from both VHF-1 as well as VHF-2. Pretty cool, so I thought I'd let you guys know. So, the bottom row of audio reception knobs here achieves the same function, but for navigational audio instead. Now, I must preface this by saying that my knowledge of navigational radios is quite limited, but I will tell you guys the basics of what I found out from my research. So, if you guys have never flown in a general aviation aircraft and have no prior experience with aviation, then it's important for you to understand that not all frequencies are used for voice communication. Some radio frequencies can also be used to allow an aircraft's navigation systems to synchronize with different navigational beacons littered all over the world, which allow the aircraft to perform complex visual approaches as well as perform perfect auto land procedures using the ILS or instrument landing system during difficult weather conditions. However, along with communicating effortlessly with the complex navigational systems present in these modern airliners, these navigational beacons also emit different Morse code identifiers and different sounds to allow pilots to listen to them and tune into different courses, headings, and tracks to be able to fly an approach when the automatic navigation system doesn't work as intended. Therefore, starting from the left here, we have the two VOR radios, which stand for VHF Omnidirectional Range Radios. In a nutshell, VOR radios are fixed radio beacons on the ground that transmit radio waves in all directions, allowing aircraft to intercept a specific course to either move away from or move toward these VOR beacons. They're essentially checkpoints that aircraft can use to help navigate in the air. Moving further right, we have this MKR knob, which stands for Approach Marker. Now, certain airports and runways are fitted with approach markers that also sound different tones in the flight deck as the aircraft approaches the runway to act as an aid to pilots when performing landings during harsh weather. Moving further right, we have an ILS knob, which, as mentioned before, stands for Instrument Landing System. Now, in future videos of this series, we'll take a detailed look at how to perform an ILS landing in this aircraft, as it is by far the most common form of landing in modern airliners. So I'll skip the explanation for now. Moving along, we have an MLS knob, which stands for Microwave Landing System, which, as the name implies, emits microwaves to be able to plot the location of the aircraft and assist it during approaches and landings. Finally, we have a set of two ADF radios on the right, which stand for Automatic Direction Finders, which are just another type of radio beacon on the ground to be used for aircraft navigation purposes. And that's that for the audio reception knobs. Alright, so finally on this panel, we have this middle row of switches which pertain to some miscellaneous functions. So starting from the left here, we have this interphone radio switch, which has three different positions. This top INT position is switched to by the pilots to receive audio from the boom mic or the mic within the oxygen masks when worn. 
The middle neutral position disconnects the specialized interphone microphones from transmission. Reception of audio is therefore normal in this case. Finally, the bottom-most RAD position allows pilots to exclusively listen to only radio communication and manually turn off any interphone communication within the aircraft. Moving further right, we have this on voice button, which when pressed inhibits the navigational radio sounds coming from the ADF and VOR radios so that only voice communication can occur throughout the aircraft. This illuminates the green on light on the button. Right next to this switch, we also have this reset button, which resets any call lights on the VHF or HF radio switches as well as the mech light on the service or cabin interphone system if pilots choose to ignore them. Finally, on the very right, we have another transmission button and reception knob for the onboard PA or public announcement system. Pilots can tune into any PA occurring throughout the aircraft by pushing in the audio reception knob and can also make a PA by pushing the transmission button. Pretty self-explanatory. Alright ladies and gentlemen, so with the audio control panel explained, let's move on to the radio management panel. This is where pilots will normally input different radio frequencies to communicate with different ATC units. These include clearance delivery, ground control, tower control, departure and approach, as well as center control. So let's not waste any more time and get right into the different buttons and switches on this panel. So at the very top here, we have the frequency displays and transfer button. Pilots can use this white knob to manipulate the frequency on the standby frequency display, as you guys can see here. Once the appropriate frequency has been dialed into the standby frequency display, pilots can push this transfer button in the middle to swap the frequencies on these two displays and switch the standby frequency to be the active frequency and vice versa. Pilots often pre-dial the frequency of the next air traffic control unit on the standby display just to make it easier to switch to that unit when the time is right. Coming underneath these frequency displays, we have the series of radio selection buttons. As you can see, these buttons yet again correspond to the voice communication radios. So we have the VHF radios, the HF radios, as well as an AM radio. Pilots can select between these radios by pressing the corresponding buttons, which will also consequently change the frequencies shown on these displays. Finally, this bottom strip of buttons are the nav buttons we looked at in the audio control panel up above. Now, I must say that these buttons are rarely ever used. This is because the Airbus A320 family of aircraft handles all navigational course inputs as well as nav frequencies by itself, depending on the way the flight management computers on board have been programmed for flight. These buttons down here, depending on what the pilots select, deactivate automatic radio tuning and allow pilots to manually enter a nav aid, course, or nav frequency in these displays. Finally, over on the right here, we also have a simple on-off switch that allows pilots to turn off both the audio control panel as well as the radio management panel. And that's that for the backup radio system housed on the lower overhead panel here. However, as mentioned before, the two radio panels on the central pedestal also accomplish the same function and are completely identical. Alright, so coming further underneath, we have the flight control computers. Now, I already covered all of these buttons as well as the three other flight control computers on the left side of the lower overhead panel in the first episode of this Aircraft Dissected series, so go check that episode out if you haven't already. So coming further below, we have the Cargo Heat Control Panel. As the name suggests, this panel also allows pilots to gain control over the temperature and heating system within the cargo bays within the aircraft. Additionally, it also helps in mitigating the effects of smoke or fire within the cargo bay, if such a circumstance does arise. Now keep in mind that this panel will differ based on aircraft type. For example, the buttons and knobs you see on this panel are those that can be found on an A319. A320s or A320neo variants might have slightly different looking cargo heat control panels. This is perfectly fine though, since pilots barely even touch this panel and you as simmers will probably never need to touch this panel, so a basic understanding of the knobs will suffice. So starting from the left here, at the top, we have the forward isolation valve switch for the forward cargo bay. When no lights are illuminated, it signifies that the system is running in the auto configuration. This means that the forward inlet and outlet valves are opened with the extraction fan running to provide circulation of air within the forward cargo bay. 
A fault light here illuminates when either the inlet or outlet valves are in disagreement with the selected position. Finally, an off light signifies that both the valves have been turned off and the forward compartment extraction fan has also been turned off. This means that ventilation is lost in the forward cargo bay and temperature can no longer be controlled within it. Beneath this forward isolation valve switch is a cargo temperature selector knob, which allows pilots to manually control the temperature of the forward cargo bay. The knob is normally left in the middle auto position though, so no need to worry about it. Moving to the right, we have a similar set of switches for the aft cargo bay, so we have an aft isolation valve switch as well as an aft temperature selector knob. We do however have one other button here which is the hot air button at the top. Just like most other buttons in the A320 family of aircraft, when no light is illuminated, it implies that the system is running in the auto configuration. This means that hot air can be supplied to both the cargo bays using specialized ducts to control the temperature within these compartments. An amber fault light indicates that a duct overheat has been detected within the cabin and an off light obviously means that supply of hot air has been restricted to either cargo bay, implying the loss of any form of temperature control in these compartments. And that's that for the cargo heat control panel. Alright ladies and gentlemen, next up here we have the cargo smoke panel, which as the name implies, deals with the implications of detecting and mitigating the effects of smoke in either of the two cargo bays. So on either side we have a red guarded switch as well as a button. Starting with the buttons themselves, these are the cargo smoke lights for the forward and aft cabin respectively. Both cargo bays are fitted with two respective SDCUs, which stand for smoke detection control units, as well as a set of two individual smoke detectors. In the event that both smoke detectors detect the presence of a smoke in either of these cargo compartments, they immediately alert the respective SCDU, which illuminates a red smoke indication on these lights. In such an event, pilots would flip open this guarded switch and push the enclosed button in two to discharge the fire extinguishing agents within the squibs, two of which are located within each cargo bay. This allows pilots to detect smoke as well as take action and prevent the effects of a fire in either of the cargo compartments mid-flight if necessary. Finally, in the middle, we also have a little test button that allows pilots to test whether the smoke detection systems within each of the cargo bays are operating nominally, so pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so with the cargo smoke panel covered, we're pretty close to being done with the right-hand column of the lower overhead panel. So the next panel we have here is the ventilation control panel. The buttons on this panel are again pretty self-explanatory, as they all deal with ventilation within different regions or zones in the aircraft. So starting from the left here, we have the blower fan as well as the extraction fan ventilation switches. Both of these systems pertain to the cooling fans that cool sensitive electronic equipment such as onboard flight computers and complex electrical circuitry within the aircraft. When no light is illuminated, it implies that the fans are running in the auto configuration for normal aircraft operation. When either of these buttons are pushed in, this override light illuminates, signifying that the respective fans have been manually turned off and ventilation to the appropriate region in the aircraft has been shut off. Finally, a fault light implies a duct overheat or a lack of air pressure within the ventilation systems for these fans. Finally, on the right here, we also have this cabin recirculation fans switch, which obviously controls the ventilation within the passenger cabins as well as lavatories within the aircraft. This button only has an on and off indication. An on indication obviously implies that the cabin fans are operating nominally, and an off indication comes on when either the button is pushed in manually by the pilots or a fault within the ventilation system forces the fans to shut down. And that's that for the ventilation control panel. Alright ladies and gentlemen, so with that all done, we get to the final panel on the right hand column of the lower overhead panel, which is the engine manual start and ignition panel. As the name again suggests, this panel houses two manual engine start buttons for both engines in case the flight crew needs to start up the engines manually. Now from all the research I could accumulate, I couldn't figure out any advantageous times for the flight crew to actually perform a manual engine start, but my initial research has shown that it is a fairly common procedure during high altitude terrain operations. 
Now, the Airbus A320 family of aircraft is extremely well automated and regulated by onboard systems, which regulate the opening and closure of various valves during the engine start procedure, all of which are inhibited when pilots choose to start the engines manually. However, if such a procedure is indeed chosen, then pilots can push these buttons given the proper engine start criteria is met to be able to start both engines. So pretty self-explanatory, and again, in a sim-based environment, not two switches that you will ever end up using. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the exploration of the right-hand column on the lower overhead panel on the Airbus A320. If you made it this far, congratulations! You now have a sound understanding about every major system on this aircraft and are now aware of the functionality of practically every knob, switch, alarm, and light above the pilots in the flight deck. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description, including a written text version of this entire video, if you prefer to read those and understand more about this aircraft. That being said, the next video in the series will focus on the central pedestal, which houses everything from the MCDU, the throttle quadrant, as well as important levers such as the flap and spoiler levers. So if you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comment section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.